All right, so Father, we just invite you and your Holy Spirit, Lord, into this time of teaching and looking into your word and learning and growing. Lord, we know that no matter how many times we've heard a a particular subject or topic, Lord, that you can show us new things in it, Father, and you can even show us the old things that we're not even applying yet, Father. And um, Lord, your word says, the Apostle Paul said, I will not fail to put you in remembrance of these things. Even though I know you know them and you're established in these present truths, I will continue to remind you. So Lord, we just thank you for reminding us. Show us exactly what we need to hear this morning. Lord, I pray that not just the words I speak, Lord, but the words you speak to each person here, Father, would have a deep impact and that there would be a lasting um, imprint of your word and lasting change in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, I've been thinking about morning, Linda. Um, the power of the word of God, the word itself, and how we're talking about renewing our minds and how what is used by God, the tool that's used is the word of God. And the primary scripture that I think of that comes to my mind when I think of that topic is Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive and full of power and sharper than a two-edged sword. So... My teaching is based around Hebrews 4.12, one of my favorite scriptures. Um, But as I looked at Hebrews 4.12, and as I look at any scripture, I always look at the context around that. And so the context around Hebrews 4.12 took me kind of in a different direction, um, which actually Steve taught a few weeks ago in the main service. Um, A little bit of what he taught influenced what I'm teaching today. So then we'll get into Hebrews 4.12 at the end of this. So we use the word of God to renew our minds. Um, And the word is alive and full of power, and so it's going to do that. But we have to understand the rest. Remember, Steve, what was it you said when you were teaching about not fighting and... What was the phrase you kept repeating? Grit, Grit, will, will, and determination. I'm going to do this by my grit, will, and determination. That is what impacted me mainly from your teaching. That's what stayed with me. It was very good, very good. Um, So when I was looking at Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, the context around Hebrews 4.12, it talked a lot about entering God's rest. Entering his rest. And so if you want to turn to chapter 3 of Hebrews, we're mainly going to be there. A couple other scriptures, I guess, that we'll be going to. But <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 3 talks of entering God's rest. We enter his rest through faith in Jesus. And that produces the salvation of our souls. So we're going to talk also today about spirit versus soul. And the difference between the two. Morning, guys. Find a seat anywhere. The front row is open, if you'd like. <laughs> but you don't have to, because I know nobody likes it. <laughs> Here, I'll move back. So in Hebrews 3.19, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase and pick little pieces out of different scriptures to start. In Hebrews 3.19, it says that the people, <clears throat> the Israelites, were not able to enter God's rest because of their unbelief. So it's talking about salvation. He he wasn't able to save them, help them, because they didn't believe. And in uh, Hebrews 4.2, it says the message that was preached was heard by a lot of people, but it didn't benefit some because it wasn't mixed by faith in everyone who heard it. Those who mixed faith with the message, well, salvation was given to them. They were helped. But those who didn't mix faith, they didn't get to enter into God's rest. And so New Testament, it's speaking of salvation, God's rest. <clears throat> and then in chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Now we who have believed do enter that rest. So it requires faith for us to enter God's rest. I mean, don't we all want to stop striving and working and exercising our grit, will, and determination all the time, just like, oh, trying to climb the ladder of success? It would be nice just to... Relax and enter God's rest. <laughs> you know, he did the work. All we have to do is enter his rest. But remember, this is all in context of renewing our minds, right? So as we go, I want you to remember that. And then in Hebrews 4 9, it says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now, what did God do on the Sabbath? He rested from all of his labor, his, labor, his works, right? 
So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his work, his own work. No longer trying to earn salvation, in other words, or entrance into heaven. We don't have to work. We all know that. We don't have to work to gain salvation. It's by faith in Jesus. However, once we have obtained that salvation, there is some work that needs to be done. So when he talks about entering his rest in Hebrews 3 and 4, he's talking about salvation. So I'm going to just open up my Bible. I have the scriptures typed out. But it's kind of nice to look at the whole thing at once. <clears throat> so there's an instantaneous salvation where we put our faith in Jesus, right? We get saved right then and there. So that's the salvation of what within the person? Your spirit. Your spirit is saved. The Holy Spirit is now living inside of you within your spirit. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one, right? Right? So there's that instant moment where you get saved. But then there's more rest to come as we obtain the salvation of our souls, of our souls. So there's two kinds of salvation we're talking about here. And there are scriptures that will clarify this. As I go on through the teaching, don't worry, we'll look at scriptures that will explain this. So we rest in the finished work of Jesus that he did on the cross allowing God's word to work in our hearts. So then, as different scriptures, as you've read throughout your sojourn through the word of God, you've seen scriptures about doing and working. Our doing is not in as in earning, right? Our doing in the Christian life is not as in earning. I'm not earning God's favor. He's already given it to me. I'm not earning salvation. I've already got it. <clears throat> I just exercised my faith, and he gave it to me. So my doing is as in exercising. It's a working out of the old nature and a working in of the new nature. So, to talk about this a little deeper, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and you'll <coughs> start to understand what I'm saying. 1 Peter is to the right of Hebrews. Chapter 1 and verses 7 through 9. And I'm just going to kind of paraphrase... Because it kind of goes off into some parenthetical phrases that I don't, that kind of can confuse. I want to stay to the point. First Peter 1 7. It said that these, these trials, the verse before it implicates trials, these trials have come so that your faith, which is refined by fire, may be proved genuine. And then in verse 9, and you are receiving the goal of your faith, that is the salvation of your souls. The salvation of your souls. Does anyone's Bible say the salvation of your soul? Yeah. Okay. Different um, translations worded a little differently, maybe. But the salvation of your soul. The word salvation in the Greek is soteria, and it means to rescue. So we go through trials, we go through fire, we go through difficulties in life, so that it will prove our faith to be genuine, and the goal of our faith is the salvation or the rescue of our soul. Now, my spirit's already been saved, but my soul, my mind, will, and emotion still needs to be rescued. And we're going to look at that word soul. It's suke in the Greek. <clears throat> Break it down a little bit. The goal of our faith is the salvation of our souls. So we get saved, and then all through our Christian life, our Christian walk, our souls are hopefully being saved, being rescued. Now, they don't have to. We can still be saved and not grow a whole lot. Some people grow a whole bunch, and other people grow a little bit. They still love God, and you know, hopefully we're growing a lot. But we all grow at different rates, and we grow in different areas, and we, we grow in different amounts. But the goal of our faith is that rescue of our soul, our, the changing of our soul. And we're going to see why as we go on. So turn with me now to Matthew 16. <clears throat> Matthew 16. He uses, in Matthew 16, the word soul four times, but it's used a little differently. And it's in reference to denying yourself, taking up your cross. But before we get to that scripture, let's back up, and I think maybe verse 23 is where Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Is that right? 16, 23-ish. He says, 
Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block for me. For you don't have in mind, so remember we're talking about the soul, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So when our souls don't have the things of God in mind, the word of God having renewed our minds, then we become a stumbling block to ourselves, to the people around us. When we're thinking carnal thoughts, when we're thinking the ways of man, Okay, we've got this bill that came in the mail. We can't pay it, so I'm going to go out and get a second job. Well, maybe that's what God wants you to do, but maybe not. Maybe he wants you just to trust him and pray and let him provide the money. Let him supernaturally so that you're not working and striving, but you're resting in God. And trust, you already have a job. You're you're doing the right thing. You're obeying the scripture. Maybe he wants you, I don't know. It depends on the situation. Maybe he does want you to go out and get a second job. But you see my point? There's a rest that comes. And if we have in mind the things of God, then we don't become stumbling blocks. We don't offend other people. We don't even offend ourselves and trip ourselves up as we're moving forward in life. We have to renew our minds so that we have in mind the things of God. Did it make any sense to Peter that Jesus was going to go to the cross and be crucified and leave them and abandon them? Peter had in mind, I want you to stay here with us. I don't want you to be killed. I don't want you going off and doing this and suffering. I I love you, Jesus. I love having you around. You've led me. You've taught me. I want you here. But he had in mind the things of man instead of the things of God. It made sense. The things of man made sense. But Jesus said, you need to renew your mind, Peter, because you are tripping me up. You are tempting me to not go to the cross, and I don't want to do that. That's what Satan would have me do. Even though it makes sense to us, That I should stay here, I shouldn't do that. So, the goal of our faith is the salvation of our soul, and we need to have in in mind the things of God. So let's go on to verse 24 in Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. That means utterly deny, disown, and abstain from himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life Now, the word life there is suke in the Greek, and that means soul. So soul, meaning the seat of your feelings, desires, your likes and dislikes, your your mind, will, and emotions. So let me start over. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his soul or his life will lose it. But whoever loses his soul or his life, His mind, will, and emotions hands it over to me and lets me replace it with my... Peter, you're a stumbling block. You don't have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of man. You need to lose your mind. You need to lose your soul. You need to renew it. Get those thoughts out. Work those thoughts out and bring new thoughts in. Whoever wants to save his mind will lose it. But whoever loses his mind for me... Remember that's suke. So they translated it life. Which, if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, it will say life, it will say soul, it will say the seat of feelings, desires, affections, and aversions. So that's my mind. That's where I like things, I dislike things, I feel things. That's all in my soul, my mind, my brain. Whoever loses his life or his soul for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world? And forfeits his soul to the detriment of his soul. Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will will reward each person according to what he has done. According to the work he has done. So we're talking about entering in the rest of God. Entering into his rest and resting in God and what he has done. But yet he's saying there's work that we need to do in changing our souls. There's work we need. Peter, you don't have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of man. Change it. And then, are you going to deny yourself, disown yourself, and lose your soul and gain new thoughts and adopt my soul, my thoughts? So, I don't know. if I, Am I getting this across clearly? Yeah. Are you confused? Because I feel confused. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> the teacher shouldn't feel confused. <laughs> So there's a reward for what you will do. There's a rest for entering into spiritual rest where you get saved. You no longer have to strive for salvation. But yet then it says in the scripture, he will reward each person according to what he has done. So there are things that we need to do. There is work that needs to be done. 
In James 2.14, you can turn there or you can not. It says, what good is it if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, has no work? I believe, we can, you know, sit in a chair. I'm going to switch my computer. I believe, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Oh, I'm a believer. I believe everything, but I'm not going to get up and do something with what I believe. I'm not going to put it into action, but I, I believe. I am definitely a believer. So that's what James is talking about. What good is it if we claim to have faith, but we have no deeds, no work to accompany the faith, no exercising, working out of our faith? Can such faith save him? And the word save means to sanctify. So we're in a process of sanctification. Not doing it by our will and determination, but resting in the fact that God's word is alive. Hebrews 4.12. That's the goal of this teaching is to get to Hebrews 4.12. But this is the whole context around Hebrews 4.12. It's rest. Entering God's rest through faith. But yet our faith has to have action with it. We can't just sit there and say, I believe, and the Bible says works works are bad. I don't want to be a person who does works. But works to gain salvation, that's bad. You can't earn salvation. I I know of Catholic family members who, you know, they, they think by feeding the poor and going out and doing certain things and serving on church committees that that will save their souls. That's what they've been taught. But we know that's not correct. The Bible says it's just by faith. It's a gift. You can't do anything to earn it. But once we've received that gift by faith, there is work to be done. Now, we still don't earn God's favor by doing these things. God says he's given us favor. He he loves us and he wants to bless us just because we are, because we exist in his kingdom. We don't have to earn it. We can't earn it. But can such faith sanctify a person, he says in James? Faith without deeds, can that kind of faith sanctify you? Can it set you apart? Can the process of sanctification, the journey, work through not exercising our faith? He's implying no. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So there is a working out, not an earning, but there's a working out of action we need to put to our faith, of exercising the word, changing the way we think, And then that will produce what we need to do on the outside that will work out the things inside of us. He goes on to say, actually, in James 2, you know, if you see somebody who has no food and they have no clothing and you say, Aw, bless you, be warmed and be filled. I believe in Jesus, be warmed and be filled. But we do nothing. He's saying, is that even faith? No. We have to actually get up and give them food and give them clothing. Then we are exercising our faith. Then we have real faith. So we know we have real faith if we're doing something with it. I used the example last week of I'm constantly telling God, you said, you said, God, that you sent your word and you healed me. So therefore, I'm going running. And if I feel a little bit of pain, as I did yesterday in the first four miles, I just said, you know what, God, you said, you said, that the son of righteousness is inside of me and he is arising within me with healing in his wings. You said it. You said you sent your word. I'm reminding God of what he said and you know what happens? The pain goes away. Faith in action is real faith. But faith saying, oh, I believe he healed me, but I'm not going to get up and go do anything. I, I feel sick. I have the flu. You said you healed me, but I think I'm just going to rest because my flesh wants to rest. Right? It's our flesh that causes us to pull back and want to rest. But Faith is voice activated. Faith is voice activated. Okay, reminding God of what he said, speaking well, it out. Else. We have uh-huh. to speak it, hear it. I heard Joyce Meyer say this the other day on one of her teachings. She said, we speak the word out, it crawls up around our face into our ears and goes down into our spirits. That's the way she sees things. It's so funny. Yeah, it's like, it goes back into our spirits. Yeah, and we build our faith by speaking it. And then by acting on it, putting action, putting legs, work to the faith. <clears throat> okay, now we're getting to the final objective of this teaching, which is Hebrews 4.12. I wanted to set that, um, kind of that scene of Hebrews 4.12 is coming in after all that rest, all that talk about rest. 
And I was not getting it, because I always look at the context of a scripture, because it tells you so much about a scripture. And in verse 12 of Hebrews 4, it says, for the word of God is alive. Okay, well, if you look back at verse 11, it says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. So it's through believing, right? It's through faith that we enter God's rest. Make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive. So the way I connected it, and maybe you'll have some different understanding that you could share. The word of God is a living thing. And it's going in and it's searching out our hearts. And it's showing us if we believe or if we don't believe. Make every effort to enter that rest for or because... The word of God is a living thing, and we need to let it do its work. As we let it do its work, then we can rest in that word doing its work. We just need to believe and then let God's word work. So the word of God, or the word that God speaks, the Amplified says, is alive. It's not dead. It's not inert. It's not powerless. The word of God is full of power. It's full of life. So it's not like just some other words on a page. Have you ever noticed you could read, let's pick any nonfiction book, nonfiction. So a book about, you know, a self-help book about changing your life, doing better, or business, you know, getting organized and stuff. You could read it and read it and read it, and ooh, it's so interesting. But then you read the Word of God. And how many of us have experienced, like, getting really tired, reading the Word of God, like falling asleep? Have you ever experienced that? It's like, I can read anything else, and I don't fall asleep, but I read the Word. Well, my opinion is, it's because it's different. It's alive. It's a living thing. And as it's coming in, it is convicting. It is doing all kinds of work inside of me. And my flesh, like, tires of it fast, I think, because... It's doing something in me. It's not just informing me of how I can get organized in my office. It is doing something in there. So I think I don't have a handle on this at all, like fully, but I think it has something to do with the fact that it's alive. So it's alive. It's powerful, full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. Its power is seen. Now, this is all in addition to the scripture. This is all like from the Greek and different commentaries I've read and the Amplified. Its power is seen in awakening the conscience, laying bare the secret feelings of the heart. It's powerful. It's laying bare the secret. So when I'm reading it, it's doing a lot. As I'm studying it and putting it in and trusting in it and getting the understanding, the word of God is at work inside of me. It makes me think of this one movie I saw where... um, it was like a sci-fi movie, and the guy is like strapped down to a table, and the bad guy releases these little um, nano creatures, and they crawl up his face and go into his eye, and they're like finding out what's in his brain, you know, or, or a Star Trek or something where they put something in the guy's ear, and it went in and it did something in his brain. I don't know. But it makes me think of that. Like, the word of God is alive. It's crawling inside of me, and it's searching things out, not to compare God's word with bugs, but, you know, but the light. I'm talking about that living aspect that it can go in and do something inside of me. Not just search out the bad, but teach me the good, too. Enlighten me. It goes in and it brings life to those dark areas in my mind. You know, it's like we have, there's a song we sing in worship about, I don't remember now, I'm just off the cuff, Um, God searching out just the dark areas, like the chambers of my heart or something. And I might have a chamber in my heart that's really bright and enlightened and I've let God's word come in and heal me and deliver me and speak to me and, you know, just do everything it needs to do. But then I have some dark chambers that I've hidden from God, tried to hide, and I just won't let him heal. Maybe I'm just not mixing faith with the word I hear. And so it stays dark. Even though he goes in and and it's it's searching out those chambers in my heart, it remains dark because I won't mix faith with it. I refuse. The area of forgiveness would be a huge one most of us have dealt with. The, The darkness just stays in that chamber of unforgiveness, and I just won't let his word. I read it and I read it, but I will not mix faith with it because mixing faith with it means I have to step out 
And as I did the other day with somebody I couldn't forgive for 15 years, oh, I hugged him and I like was so glad to see him because I've forgiven him. And that action of faith, it was in the hugging. And not just in the hugging as I used to do, hey, okay, you know, patting him on the back and getting away as soon as I could, but in embracing this person. That action of faith then allowed God's word to bring light into that chamber. When I started doing it, and I did it this week, and it was like so easy because forgiveness came. It has to be accompanied by action to really be faith. And that's one of the toughest areas, I think, is forgiveness because oh, we don't want, want to let that person off the hook. They hurt us, and we want them to hurt. But really, we just hurt ourselves in holding on to it. We've got to put action with it. And as we keep putting action with our faith in that area, it will come. It will come. Because it didn't at first for me, but now it's totally there. And I'm so glad to see this person. So, the word is full of power, and it's awakening our conscience and laying bare the secret feelings of our hearts. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Literally, that means a two-mouthed sword. And one commentary said, it devours all before it like an animal. Like, and that, I don't know that that's the greatest comparison, an animal. But like, you know, it's going to devour. It will devour that darkness. It will devour sin. It will devour things in us that are basically, um, to speak metaphorically, cancerous within our souls that are killing us these thoughts these beliefs we have that are murdering us slowly like arsenic poisoning us it will go in and it will eat like a two-mouthed sword it devours all before it Um, it's compared to a sword to show its power to penetrate within the heart a sword like a, a roman sword would go in and penetrate deep into the heart entering in a way that nobody or anything else can. Because it's not just a self-help book that I can read and I can put down and the book can't read my mind. It can't see my thoughts. But I read God's word and I speak God's word and it goes in and penetrates my heart to the depths that nothing else and nobody else can unless I let them in. And even then I can't because I don't know all the thoughts of my heart. There are hidden thoughts and subconscious thoughts. Beliefs I have that I don't even know I have because they're like, you know, below the surface. Have you ever heard of someone who's done some horrific crime um, or, you know, or committed suicide or something and everyone around them was like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that person was feeling this way. I had no idea that was going on in their mind because nobody can. Only the word of God can go deep within our hearts and penetrate and know the thoughts of my heart. People could daydream and they can think all kinds of thoughts and nobody else will know unless they let them in. But the word of God goes in. It goes in deep. And he, it's like those little nanobugs going in and you know, saying, let me in, let me in. And we can resist it and we can push it out. And those little things are getting pushed right out. Get away from that dark chamber of my heart. I do not want you in there. We can push it out. God's a gentleman. We've heard that phrase before. He's not going to force himself on us. It's all by choice. Being healed is a choice. But if I let his word in and let it do its work, I don't have to understand how it does it. I don't get how you know penicillin works in my body to kill a virus. I don't understand all the intricacies of how medication works. But God's word is a medicine. And it will go in, and I don't have to understand it. I just need to do the job of meditating on that scripture, renewing my mind, and then acting on it wherever I can. Show me, Lord, how to act on this scripture, and I will act on it. So we, we rest in the power of his word, but then we have action, too, as it says in James. Faith without works is dead faith. It doesn't exist. It's a, an oxymoron. It's, it, we think it's faith, but it's not. We're deceiving ourselves. <clears throat> so then it says, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul, and the spirit. So the word of God goes in And it separates between our soul and our spirit. Now, my spirit has the Holy Spirit in it. My spirit's been born again. My spirit's in good shape, strong, tough. My soul, on the other hand, is a little mushy, a little soft, a little carnal, a little messed up. And the word of God will go in and separate and divide between the two. 
Um, the Amplified says, between the immortal spirit and of the joints and marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, the very center of action, motives, beliefs, plans, and feelings. The word of God will go in and separate and divide between God's plans, which are in my spirit, and my plans, which are in my soul. And he'll show us what exactly we need to do to get in line with his spirit so that we won't be like Peter. And God won't be saying, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind my thoughts. You have in mind the things of man. And this is going to make people stumble. And you're going to stumble. Your destiny is over here. But you're heading in this direction because you have in mind the things of man instead of the things of God. I want you going in this direction. I have people for you to help. There's a world out there for you to save by preaching the word or loving them, whatever it is. And you can't do it if you're heading in this direction when your destiny is over here. <clears throat> the Amplified goes on saying, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. So the word of God is exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of my heart. It lays open these motives and feelings in my inner private life, even to the depths of things we think are unhealable and impenetrable. That's what, uh, I don't know where I'm, if I saw that in the Strongs or somewhere else, but things we think are unhealable. Things I think, God, you cannot set me free from this. Maybe I haven't consciously thought that, but I believe I'll never be free from this thing. I've thought that about my my shins, the pain, my knees and shins. This is never going to go away. Okay, what else will I do? I have to do something. What else will I do instead of running? And then, oh, I get in, in mind the things of God, and I realize, no, I don't have to put up with that. No, God wants me well. He said I would run and not be weak, right? I'd be strong like the eagles and rise up and, and you know, he'd renew my youth and he'd do all these miraculous things. I do not have to accept that. God's word, he sent it and it healed me. So I'm going to get in mind the things of man instead, or the things of God instead of the things of man and let him do his thing inside of me. I even trust that when I speak out his word, that his word, it's alive and full of power, is going in to my physical body and healing. I, I imagine it. I picture it. He's like, you know, recreating whatever bone or, or tendons or whatever needs to be fixed. And if whatever you have, whether it's diabetes or a, a tumor or, you know, whatever it is in our bodies, we release the word and it's like those little nanobites of the word. They're going in. They're going in and they're fixing and they're eating up that, that cancer or they're, causing our blood chemistry to change or whatever they have to do. But it's alive and it's full of power and it's doing a job in my physical body. But I have to release it. God, you said, you said this. I'll put you in remembrance of your word. You sent it and you said it would not return to you void, but it will accomplish what you said it would do. So you said it, I'm going to remind you and let it go into me and do it. So why a two-edged sword in verse 12? Romans used a two-edged sword, <clears throat> and um, it, it's because it was easier to penetrate and cut in every way and with every movement. A two-edged sword was easier. In verse 13, it says, Not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of, whom, of him with whom we have to do. Naked and defenseless. God... I can't do it, but your word can. I'm going to rest in that and just release your word and let it go out in its living way and do the thing it needs to do. Whether it's healing a relationship, um, whether it's getting me to my future, whether it's bringing favor upon my life, all I have to do is confess the word. God, you said, let it out and then act on it, whatever I need to do, and it will be done. John 6.63 says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus said that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, God. And we just, um, I pray, God, that this, this week and throughout our lives, God, that we would continue to see your word as a living and powerful thing. Father, that your word, that we would value your word, Father. And as we release it, we trust in it, we read it, and we release it, Lord, that it is doing 
whatever you've sent it to do. Father, I trust that that scripture that I confess, that I speak out my mouth, Lord, that says you sent your word and you healed me, that it contains healing, Lord. And as I release it by faith into my spirit, as we do that, Father, Lord, we trust that your word will do whatever it says it will do, that it's alive and full of power, God. We thank you, Lord, for helping our spirits, just opening our spirits, Lord, to receive the truth of your word, to renew our minds, God, to realize there is something that is effective and powerful, God, and that is your word. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.